Hello, and welcome to the Method Space Live webinar, Write Your Book from Acquisition to Publication, hosted by Janet Sammons with guests Leah Fargustein and Eric Garner. This is Michael Todd, the Social Science Communication Manager at Sage Publishing. And I want to tell you that this one hour webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We'll be sending out a link to view it uh, by email, and uh, we will also have to all registrants, and we will also host it on methodspace.com. Now, our host today is Janet Sammons, the Methods Guru for Sage's Methods Based Web Community, and a free range scholar through Vision to Lead. As a qualitative methodologist, she has extensive experience supervising doctoral research and writing about methods. In fact, a new edition of her Doing Qualitative Research Online is forthcoming from SAGE and Publishing from Your Doctoral Research, Create and Use a Publication Strategy from Routledge is in press. Janet will be talking to two SAGE editors involved in acquiring and publishing books, Leah Fargustein, an acquisition editor focusing on research methods, and Eric Garner, managing editor of SAGE's U.S. book production. And a quick aside, SAGE's journals team will host a webinar on how to get published in February. So for those of you with breaking research, you should consider keeping an eye on Method Space for details on that webinar as they become available. Now some technical things. If any of you have any quest any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box, it's probably on the right of your screen, and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. At the end of the presentation, we'll have some time for Q&A from attendee attendees. So please also use the Q&A box to ask questions for our guests. And feel free to post questions throughout the webinar, but we will be addressing them during the Q&A portion. And please also take note of the webinar hashtag, method, hashtag MethodSpaceLive. And feel free to ask questions or leave comments there. And if you don't mind, why not send us a message right now telling us where you're logging in from in, uh, in our chat box. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Janet. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. And welcome to anyone who is watching the recorded version of this webinar. Um, we have a very simple agenda here today. Um, first, I'll give a very brief overview, and then we will uh, start with acquisitions and move to the production side, and then I'll continue with the Q&A. And we will um, keep answering the questions. We don't have time to discussed today on methodspace.com. So I'll log in in the coming weeks and we'll uh, continue to give you content on these topics. So I'm here to add a writer's perspective to this discussion. In addition to a long time association with SAGE, uh, I've written and reviewed for pretty much all of the major academic publishers. But when I got started, I knew absolutely nothing about book production. And just writing a book seemed like a monumental accomplishment. So I thought kind of that was, that was it. But I discovered there is a lot more uh, involved and I really wasn't prepared for all of those stages. And that caused me a, a few headaches and kind of a, you know, scheduling uh, reconfiguration, shall we say. Um, I strongly believe that we need new diverse voices in academic and textbook publishing. So, you know, while it is a, a lot of work, I hope that this webinar and the related resources we're posting on MethodSpace will help you to move forward with projects you have in mind. Just a couple more observations kind of from the, what I've learned as a, as a writer. First, expect to take an active role every step of the way. So from the concept through uh, the final publication and even after that uh, for promotion of the book. Next, be careful when you commit to the schedule for your book project. I might say be realistic and communicate any delays uh, promptly. Hiding from your editor is not a strategy. Third, keep in mind that uh, while you may think that writing is something that you're doing on your own, it really is a collaborative process. And uh, certainly you might have co-authors or co-editors or uh, contributors to an edited book. 
you might need to uh, engage uh, outside experts like graphic designers or maybe some uh, technical folks to help you with uh, some pieces of your uh, project. But you also have your um, acquisitions editor, copy editors, and others. And like any collaboration, mutual respect goes a long way towards smooth progress. The first steps towards publication fall in the domain of acquisition. So I'm going to turn it over to Leah Farkenstein, uh, the Sage Acquisitions Editor in uh, Research Methods. Uh, Leah? Hi, thanks, Janet. Um, so I'm here to talk about becoming a book author and the proposal and writing process for a book. So the first step in um, making your, your book is to conceptualize your book. So what kind of book is it? Is it for a wider audience? Is Does it have mass market appeal? Is it based on your research or you want to publish your dissertation, in which case it's a monograph? Or is it for use in a course or instructional setting? And that's really what I'm going to focus on today is this kind of textbook publishing. It's most of what Sage does. Um, and if you're thinking about other pro book projects, hopefully some of this will apply. Um, I think, you know, there's some good principles you can follow as well. So when you, you're thinking about your book, the first thing you want to do is, is refine your idea. And so I kind of just start at the bottom and go up. So what is the contribution you want to make to your book? And this isn't the same thing as originality, um, especially for a textbook. It doesn't have to be wholly new and radical. But let's say you want to do a sociology book for a flipped classroom. That's a contribution that maybe hasn't been done before. And then you want to think through that and really come up with a justification, like a rationale behind the book. Why is this book necessary? So if you're, why is your current book not working if you're teaching sociology in a flipped classroom? What could you do better in a book uh, that would really justify the creation of a new a new text and then really think about the market placement too so who is going to use this book is it community college instructors undergraduate graduate level what kind of disciplines will it apply to um, what sorts of students are the ones who are going to read your book things like that and then I think once you have those three pieces down you can start to really think through the features so um, think broadly, I would say, and really think about those features that are necessary to um, contribute to the integrity and the, the support of the book in, in terms of the rationale. So not just, you know, what would be cool, but, you know, if you have a sociology for a flipped classroom text, what kind of instructor support do you offer? What do you need to do to make sure that students are reading the book? What kind of features and characteristics can you offer at that point? And then um, I think we skipped one slide. There's a, if you go back, no? Okay. Um, there is a part where you need to find the right publisher. And so at that point, you know, you do want to look at publishers in terms of, of disciplines. What disciplines do they publish? Um, make sure that, that either, either have an acquisitions that are dedicated to that discipline or they've already published in it. What kind of markets? Uh, do they publish in if, if making sure they match with yours? Publishers of various sizes can have sorts of different effects on your book. If you have a smaller or a very niche book, you may want to look for a smaller publisher. But if you have a, a bigger intro book, you would might want to look for a larger publisher that can really support that effort. And um, make sure that the publisher can support what you want to do. If there's a specific feature of a book, if it, you want it published in four color, if that's necessary for the audience, make sure the publisher can do that as well by looking at their current offerings. So once you've selected the publisher, you've got your idea pretty well sketched out, you can make contact. So I would say at this point, reach out to an editor and you only need a couple paragraphs on your book, really detailing the broad strokes, and maybe send them a CV or a summary of your teaching and publishing experience. You don't need to send them a finished book. You don't need to send them the proposal at this stage. You're just trying to get an idea of, is this going to fit with their publishing program? And really allow them to, to help you shape this book. Publishers are gonna have this bigger course knowledge that they can offer you. So make sure to take advantage of that, and if you've already written the whole book, I think it's harder to change at that point. So when you reach out, if everything goes well, the publisher will give you some proposal guidelines and then you get to go off and, and write the proposal. And you can have an exchange with your publisher too, they can contribute as well. But 
really the proposal is is something you'll have to put together. So what makes a good proposal good? Um, the description um, is always important. It shouldn't be a sale, but you need to, to provide the justification. Um, the, for the course market, you want to make sure that you've looked at other books in the market or that you've done a broader kind of search outside just your own classroom. What are the other kinds of current topics going on in your, in your types of course that you want to write for? And while your proposal will initially be directed to the editor and the editor will re review it, Ultimately, the, the decision will come down to instructors. So make sure that you're writing to the instructors as well. And even though you know, it is just a proposal, while it doesn't need to be perfectly copy edited or spell checked at this point, it should have the same kind of style that you want for your book. So if your proposal is, is very dry and perfunctory, I think reviewers and the editor might assume that your book will be dry and perfunctory. So try to bring some of that flavor to the proposal as well where you can. And the detailed table of contents is really the most important part of any proposal. It should look more than just an outline, but like a table of contents in a textbook. And you might try checking out a few to see what those look like, because it does have its own sort of um, rubrics and style. So that should really uh, have come out, as well as some descriptions of the chapter. If an instructor, or if, if your editor requests a sample chapter, or if you want to write one, because so, sometimes that can um, be a really beneficial thing for a proposal, uh, make sure that sample chapter looks like a book chapter, um, that it carries through the features that you say you're going to do in the, in the proposal. So if you want case studies, make sure your sample chapter contains a case study if you're going to provide learning objectives, the same thing. So then you finish your proposal and now you sent it off to the editor. So the editor, this is kind of an overview of the process, but the editor will look through it. If everything looks good, they'll send it out for peer review to instructors of the course, will give their feedback, and then once those reviews are back, there'll be a discussion. If everything looks good at this point, the editor will probably ask you for some sort of response and take the book to the publications committee. And if not, you might go back for another round of changes, another iteration, things like that. Um, and then if everything looks good at that point, uh, you'll get a contract and then you can, can start that, that writing process. So navigating the writing process is always tough. Um, it, well, the one thing I will say is it will take more time than you think, not just for you to write the book, but to put together all the different pieces of the book. And that's going to vary so much from, from book to book and from editor to editor, but it's something you'll have to kind of develop with your editor at that time. Um, definitely ask for the time you need up front. We put the deadlines and contract, um, not to be arbitrary, but because we do a lot of planning around those. And if they're not going to work for you, um, and you know that at the beginning, it's best to make the changes then so we can all have that kind of good planning. So a little more specifics about the writing and review process. I, this is just a really kind of general idea. It varies so much from book to book, and it's never this linear. But ideally, you write your chapters, you send, it, send them to the editor for feedback, and we ask you to write usually in batches so you don't just produce a whole first draft and have there be some sort of big problem throughout that we need to address. With just a few chapters, we can help you make those changes first. And then you might revise them in response to the editor feedback, in which case then they go out to reviewers, and then the reviewers send in their feedback. Now at this point, we don't want you to, to revise the chapters again, we want you to keep writing forward. Uh, this means that you don't get stuck revising the same chapters over and over again. Um, you, by the end, you've got a complete draft and hopefully with all of that reviewer feedback built up over the, the batches, you have those end chapters that really feel like what you want them to feel like for this book, that they're really hitting uh, the market and instructors like them. So then when you go back to revise, you really have less to do overall. And then at the end of the process, you've got a finished book. So uh, there's a lot more to it than that, but I think if we're just sticking to high level, if these are the key takeaways that you want to really think about your idea up front, really think about those big broad strokes of the book, and then look to publishers to find where that kind of book would fit. At that point, reach out to an editor, go through the whole proposal process, and write your book.
And now um, I'll pass it off to Eric for what's what happens after you've written your book. All, all right. Well, yeah, thanks, Leah, for um, yeah, sharing about the uh, the acquisitions uh, process and and how an idea can become a manuscript. Um, I will now focus on the uh, production aspect and how that manuscript becomes a book. So um, yeah, but first um, I, um, I'll give you um, a quick um, overview of the production department here at SAGE, uh, which has three main divisions, uh, production design and production systems. In books production, uh, production editors, yeah, we call them uh, PEs, um, manage the manuscript from transmittal to publication, um, also managing a team of freelance resources uh, who help us through that process. In the art department, the cover artists work on the book's cover design, uh, the interior yeah, design uh, booklets and other yeah, marketing materials um, that would be featured in the book. And then uh, production systems uh, support uh, both the uh, production editors and art by uh, maintaining the resources that we rely on for um, the printing of our books and um, also for our freelance needs. Um, they work with our printers in California um, as well as in uh, Michigan and Canada. Uh, and uh, they also help oversee our uh, typesetting vendors and um, um, and India where um, uh, our main vendor is in Chennai. Uh, so uh, you can sort of see that we're um, in, in production that we're um, experts in working across um, countries and time zones. All right, so uh, to the fun stuff, um, each each author uh, goes through a, a special journey with his or her uh, book. Um, now that the research and writing is, is done and the uh, book has been accepted for publication, uh, it's time for um, to get the manuscript ready for um, its final adventure. And that's where uh, yeah, I think where um, the fun starts, where um, you we uh, take um, a collection of Microsoft Word document files and turn it into um, an attractive, easy to read layout. Uh, depending on how long or complex uh, the book is, this process can take um, as long as like three to six months, um, including printing. And um, as you can see from the graphic here, uh, the main stages in, um, in the book's production um, uh, phase um, are uh, copy editing, typesetting, proofreading, and indexing. And it's the uh, production editor's job to serve as a project manager through all of these different steps and to serve as a liaison between the freelance vendors, uh, the in-house editorial staff, and the author. All right. So we'll discuss the process in greater detail, but um, so to um, answer um, an important question, uh, why do we need production? Um, well, uh, I would ask you to think about what goes through your mind when you see a typo printed somewhere. Uh, production's focus is on quality. Uh, we help um, add credibility to a book, to the um, author and to the publisher. Uh, sure, an and author can publish um, his or her thoughts online or um, self-publish. But um, but uh, he or she won't have the benefit of that like professional um, insight and um, expertise of a publisher's production. Also, we don't want to distract our readers with uh, typos and errors when we have so much uh, important 
content for them to focus on instead. Uh, production gives um, our authors um, a chance to have their manuscript read completely, address any queries, and double check references and citations before the book is actually published. This ensures that our readers are purchasing a quality product that lives up to the publisher's reputation in the academic field. So the uh, steps shown in this slide um, outline the production schedule. So, uh, those in color indicate the steps we'll be discussing first, and we'll uh, revisit those grayed out sections later as we go through the process. But uh, first, as you heard from Leah um, just a few minutes ago, the um, acquisitions uh, editor in the editorial department uh, receives the manuscript from the author. And the uh, production editor, or uh, PE, goes through the files and makes sure all of the pieces are available. Like, uh, for example, um, there's a figure of 2.1 art file to accompany the mention of figure 2.1 in chapter two, making sure that that's accounted for. Um, the PE uh, then sends the manuscript, which is typically saved as a word file, to the copy editor. In uh, copy editing, the copy editor reads through the manuscript line by line and makes uh, minor suggestions or edits based on grammar and house style. The copy editor also checks to make sure any cited resource or research has, has the uh, matching reference information in case the reader wants to go directly to that source. Uh, this is the first time that the book is read in its entirety. Sometimes the copy editor will ask the author to offer clarity or rephrase a sentence, but uh, for the most part, our goal is to preserve the author's tone and voice as much as possible. Um, uh, our copy editors um, are not in-house. Uh, most are freelancers, and some of our uh, work um, goes to our uh, vendor partners in India. So after the manuscript has been copy edited, the uh, PE submits everything to our typesetters. Personally, this is my favorite part of the process uh, because after um, all of the hard work by the um, author, the copy editor, and the uh, PE, the manuscript uh, moves closer to actually looking like a real book, um, as you'll see in the next slide. But uh, before we move on to that slide, um, yeah, uh, it, it should be mentioned that our typesetters are uh, based in, um, in India. Their uh, days start when we leave the office, so we try to schedule our projects to uh, best fit uh, both of our schedules. Right. So the uh, copy edited manuscript is in typeset. Uh, in Typeset is uh, basically a way of describing um, how the text is placed on the page. Uh, what, what first looked like uh, words on a page um, now takes on a new life. As in this next slide, you'll see like the uh, uh, photos illustrate the text, uh, sidebars and tables present features for the reader, um, and the text is displayed in a reader-friendly format um it's uh it, it's a big difference um seeing seeing the typeset version compared to the plain text that we saw in the copy editing slide the pe then uh emails the page proofs to the author a proofreader and an indexer so during the uh, page proof review um stage an important note is uh long gone are the days of returning uh, pages and, and pages of hard copy. Uh, technology now allows us to mark and um, annotate uh, proofs e e e electronically. Um, and we uh, guide our authors and proofreaders through this process. Um, 
electronic uh, proofreading saves time uh, for mailing. It's um, easier to transport. Um, it saves paper. And it also makes the job of the PE and the typesetter uh, much easier. In the old days, we would hand write our corrections and then scan them for our, our typesetters. And now we uh, just click and type. Meanwhile, uh, as the interior is being finalized, the cover designer is working with the author and editorial departments on a beautiful color uh, cover. Uh, here are um, some examples of Sage reference, Sage and uh, Corwin titles. Uh, you might wonder how our cover artists um, get inspired. Yeah, to create these covers. Well, uh, the cover artist begins work by talking to the um, acquisitions um, editor of the book and um, and gathers information like, uh, is the book's tone serious or light? Um, is it uh, practical or theoretical? Um, or um, who is the intended reader? Oh, based on the discussion with editorial, uh, the cover artists think about uh, what would work best for the book cover. Uh, regardless of the design, um, emphasizing the uh, title and author name um, is always important. Um, since the art department uh, also produces our marketing materials, the artist uh, has to con uh, consider other factors too like how the uh, cover will appear in flyers or catalogs. Um, will it stand out? Will the design be prominent if it's displayed at a conference? Um, seeing different options always helps editorial, marketing, and the cover artist decide the most ideal design. Uh, the cover artist typically drafts um, about three to five different designs for each book. Um, I've Heard that it takes about 12, uh, that that each cover takes about 12 hours and and, and lots of creativity and research. Um, sometimes the cover artist needs to search for a particular photo. Sage uses multiple photo banks um, or collections of um, photos for this kinds of research. The cover artist will um, also uh, take into uh, consideration um, ethnic diversity and gender balance uh, if there are people involved in the photo. Oh, uh, now that we've come to the end of our process, the cover is approved and ready for the printers and the interior pages have been double checked by the author and PE to ensure that all the previous rounds of edits were correctly implemented. Um, all the files are, are then sent to our printers um, who print the pages and bind them. A um, uh, quick note about our printers. Um, uh, some, some are US-based and um, some, some of our uh, four-color um, jobs um, go to Canada. So, yeah, my I, I would say that my um, my favorite part of the of production is, is is when that final book reaches my desk. You get to like uh, smell the ink, uh, flip through the pages, um, the hard work that you share with, with with the with the author and 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 with our colleagues like Leah, um, uh, it's now on bookshelves and there's uh, something, yeah, just incredibly uh, satisfying about holding the final product and knowing that uh, our authors will soon be celebrating with their own copies. And that was it for me. Th thanks, Eric. Um, before we let you go, uh, could you just say f maybe a few words about how that process might vary with uh, the ebook uh, options? 
Oh yes, um, yeah. So um, the eBooks are um, are basically um, um, exported um, into um, a different a different uh, file format, uh, usually at the end of the process. So so the um, overall um, uh, production process is is pretty. Um, is pretty much the same, with the exception of that uh, of that final step of the um, output uh, being um, an um, an ebook e e e e file. Um, and then for for um, titles that have um, that have um, ancillary content like um, companion websites or um or uh interactive um ebooks e e e e um that that content um is then um uh, sort of uh processed um toward the end of the process and um I shared with our typesetters to to um incorporate into the uh books um uh, XML file, um, and then um, yeah, yeah, you get that um, get that e e e e e e electronic uh, copy, and then um, I'm also um, um, anything that's going um, online is um, posted to to our um, hosting site. So. Just a couple of uh, points I'd like to just uh, reinforce from both of your presentations. Um, first, uh, when Leo was uh, talking about the kind of the writing process, uh, I think that a lot of people, you know, would would think that writing a book, you know, I'm going to sit down and write the whole book. But one of the things that I have found, you know, to be just extraordinarily useful is that. Um, for, for starters, that the proposal itself is reviewed by the target audience I'm planning to reach. So those comments, you know, are, are really super helpful. So, you know, people who might be considering you know, adopting the book if it's a textbook, or people who are thinking about using the book if it's more professionally oriented, um, is really helpful. And then, you know, as she mentioned, writing several chapters and sending them in for review, um, especially for my very first book, was just extremely, extremely helpful because I could get a sense, you know, people made comments about style and uh, my uh, graphics and figures, etc., so that I could learn from that as I was continuing to write. Um, and then, you know, as she mentioned, by the time you get to the final manuscript, it's kind of been reviewed along the way. So that speeds up the process for moving into the production process. Um, then the other point I wanted to just reinforce with um, some of the comments that Eric was just saying here at the end about the electronic piece, um, I try to, when I'm working on a book, I try to, to think about any ancillary materials, you know, while I'm writing the book. Um, and, you know, sometimes I might um, develop, you know, some of those materials uh, while I'm working on the book. But when you're working on the manuscript, you're kind of, you know, that's sort of a, a single focus. So when this uh, process begins, it's illustrated on this slide, that's an excellent time. And so rather than thinking, hey, I've turned in the manuscript, like, shoo, you know, done with that. That that's a good time to be working on any kind of um, electronic materials you want to have available, whether it's um, instructional resources, um, PowerPoint slides, media, you know, other kinds of things that that you want to um, have uh, ready, so that you know while your um, copy editing and and production process is underway, um, if you are working on those pieces then when the final book is ready uh, you're kind of ready to go so let's um let's open this up to your questions and what do we have michael janet can i chime on in on that just yes. for a little bit 
Sure. Yeah. Um, so I mean, with the increasing importance of ebooks and electronic resources, um, the, that kind of digital conversation, that's something your acquisitions editor is going to introduce probably even earlier in the process than at the final draft stage um, these days. So it, it depends, um, you know, on the, on the book and the market, but that's, it's definitely something that we'll be planning for on our end and that you can plan for on your end. And it's kind of getting earlier and earlier, I think, too. Right. I think, you know, thinking about what you want to include uh, early in the process also might allow you to get some feedback, you know, when you're doing the chapter review. So if Absolutely. you've sent in three chapters, you might say, well, you know, these are the kinds of ancillary materials that will go with this part of the book. Uh, what do you think? You know, then, then, you know, you're getting some feedback along the way rather than just, you know, you're off there, you know, writing in your uh, cubbyhole and, uh, you know, hoping for the best. Yeah, exactly. So what other uh, questions do we have? I'm going to weigh in right now. And um, I just want to say that please continue to send in those questions using the question box on the right side of your screen or on Twitter using hashtag MethodSpaceLive. And I, I want to stress that if we can't get to your question by the end of the hour, we'll address them in the follow-up blog post at MethodSpace.com. And I will guarantee you at this point we are not going to get to all of them because there are a ton of really good questions. So I'm going to start off with a, a series that talks about a lot of what we've been talking about is it's we're working with an individual who is writing their book. Maybe, you know, at the end of the day, after the kids go to bed, they're working on their book and then they're contacting the publisher directly. But there's some situations that that what about edited editions um, where we're taking stuff that's already written or what about working with multiple authors? And I, I'm not sure what what about that are, are are they? How does that how does that process work? How does that process work both uh, uh, in, in acquisition and then also in promote in proposing a book, especially if it's an edited edition, and then also who's responsible once it moves on through the process? Well, I, I'll, I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Leah. First, I would like to um, say that when when we're finished with this webinar, uh, I will highlight on Method Space a whole series of posts that we did about um, co-authoring and co-editing that goes into uh, a lot of detail about those kinds of options. Uh, having gone through that of editing collections uh, and co-editing collections with others, you know, I, I think designating uh, someone who has the responsibility to be the kind of liaison to your acquisitions editor uh, is really important because otherwise it would be, you know, quite confusing for the acquisitions editor to, you know, have kind of different people um, and and not, you know, so so in other words, if we've got several co-editors, um, it would be that liaison's responsibility to communicate, um, you know, the the steps and information to the rest of the team. Uh, in terms of relationship with the contributors, you know, that's kind of a whole other um, category of, uh, of things. And again, you, you know, we, we've got a series of posts about that already um, on Method Space, and I'll kind of bring those to the top of the, um, uh, you know, kind of update the, them so that you can see those easily. Leah, could you have, what would you add? Sure, yeah, I would say, um... First, regarding edited volumes, it's challenging to publish them these days, especially because so much is available online through university library subscriptions. So the necessity of really having everything in a book versus an instructor just putting links on their syllabus is probably a little less these days. That being said, there's certain course areas or needs for edited volumes that, that really do make sense. And I will also say that while you may think, oh, this is less work than writing a book, it is not. It is just a different kind of work. It's a lot more on the organizational front. Um, I've heard it referred to as herding cats. Um, so so don't don't let yourself be, be drawn into that uh, um, false kind of belief. And then also for um, for co-authored books, one of the things I, I always ask for now after having learned is a co-author strategy. And generally my preference is to at, at the very least have all authors look at all chapters for any kind of co-authored book. It really helps with the cohesion, especially if you're writing asynchronously or out of order to make sure that the book has a, 
a cohesive voice and um, a, a point of view uh, instead of a cha multiple chapters having multiple points of view. And that's something to think through early on about who's going to do what and when, um, especially if you're all, you know, writing books um, while your kids go to bed at, at, in the evening to make sure that you kind of have things as, as structured as possible before you begin. And yeah, and then. Oh, I was I was just going to chime in um, on um, on the production uh, side. Typically, there's um, there are um, there's either um, a lead editor or um, lead um, editors who um, um, who help uh, you know, coordinate the the re review um, of uh, of. Yeah, files, um, and so that uh, sort of um, helps with the organizational uh, side too. So, do I? This is again. This is all predicated on the idea that I'm I'm working directly with the publisher. It's like, should I consider hiring somebody like an agent or somebody like that to deal with this, or is this something that is easily done by by just a, an individual? Um, I can take that question. Um, I, for the most part, I think it's it's fine to do as an individual. Of course, that's coming from from my end as a publisher. Um, but I think generally, if there's anything in your contract, it should be something you should be able to talk with directly with your editor. If there's something you don't like, you should be able to negotiate that. That being said, if you're really uncomfortable with the legalese, you can look for something like a, a consultant. For textbook publishing, I generally don't recommend an agent. I don't think it's a good use of your money, honestly, because um, it, there's just not a ton of money in textbook publishing. Sometimes it's it's not the same thing as um, you know a trade book that you know will sell millions and millions of copies in the first year potentially. Um, and then trade book agents are also the structure of a trade book is very different than from the structure of a textbook. So if you are looking for that kind of legal service, I would suggest contacting the the TAA, the Textbook and Academic Authors Association. Um, they're they're a great resource for anything on that front. How do I get paid? I mean, presuming I'm not doing this out of charity, so what, what is, how, do, how does, in doing a textbook, how, what is the compensation like? How do royalties work? And I don't put up any money up front, do I? No, um, at least not for Sage, you don't put up any money up front. Uh, the compensation will be detailed in your contract. That's the first time you'd probably see it. Uh, you will get a royalty and it's paid annually. For textbooks, it can feel a little far off, especially because when we first publish a textbook that first semester, we're just trying to get copies in instructors' hands. So you won't really see any sales until the second semester after a textbook is, is published. Um, if there's a need uh, or if it's for a very big market, we feel confident that the book is, is going to go forward. There is a possibility of an advance, but that can really vary from market to market and it has to be justified for the most part you know if this is something you're writing by yourself um, after after school hopefully you don't you don't need that 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 funding right then if there's some reason you need to to pay um, a graduate assistant or someone else who's working on the book that that can be the time to talk through in advance um, but typically we're just looking for royalties um, and and then um, we're all on the same page. And advances generally do come out of your royalties eventually, so um, it, it, all, it all evens out in the end. So Eric, when you were talking about covers, it sounded like it was something that Sage would present, would, would create, and then it would work with the acquisition editor. So uh, a, a granular question and then a wider question. What if an author has somebody in mind for a cover? Can they bring that up? Is that is that acceptable? And then what would that process be like? And then that kind of opens up the idea of the larger questions, like how involved is the author or author team in working with the visuals and the graphics in the book? And it, it, is it something that you encourage or is it something that you prefer to have a hands-off relationship or does it vary? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've seen, yeah, I've seen, um, instances where, where the, um, where an author, um, has recommended, um, the yeah, artist to, um, to, to help contribute to the cover or present the, um, the actual, um, cover, 
um, idea. Um, uh, it's I, it's uh, pretty rare from from what I've um, seen um, because um, I know that uh, like uh, the like. For example, uh, Leah um, works closely with with the um, RT, knowing the market and 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 knowing what what is um, needed to um, to um, enhance the sales of the um, uh, book. So it's uh, it's it's uh, typically done um, in house, but I but, but I have seen um, instances. Um, where there is an outside um, artist, uh, and I, yeah, Leah, correct me if I'm uh, stepping on your <laughs> on your uh, yeah toes. <laughs> yeah, I I think it's it's a conversation to have with your editor to talk about the art. That's generally something either we we discuss up front if we know their specific art needs, or um, we talk about more into the final draft about how to refine that art. Um, there's a lot we can do nowadays in terms of um, just, you know, really creating polished figures online and, and in things like PowerPoint and Word, as well as any kind of uh, software you work with. Because I work on methods and stats, a lot of my authors are usually very proficient in creating figures, so I'm, I'm lucky to not have had a ton of issues. So this is Janet. I'll add in a another, um, again, we have a some material we've already um, posted on Method Space, and so I will highlight that uh, after this uh, webinar. But you know, this kind of a choice that you make as an author, you know, whether if you're going to uh, generate your own figures and photographs and any other kind of visual materials, or if you're going to use them from somewhere else, if you're going to use someone else's material. Um, you will have to get their permission to use it if it's copyright uh, protected material. Um, I personally create all of my graphics and I create all of my photographs um, because I want to uh, kind of, you know, that's kind of part of my intellectual property and, you know, I like doing it, but, you know, not everyone um, has those skills. So, you know, if you don't, um, then your choice is to either look for um, existing materials, then, you know, keep in mind that you will need to add in the time to contact uh, whoever the owner is for that uh, intellectual property to get permission uh, to use it uh, or else to, you know, find, uh, say, things in Creative Commons or other, uh, there are some uh, websites that include, like, say, Pixabay or some other sites that have uh, visuals you can uh, you can use but you'll need to make sure they are um, available for commercial use because you're selling your book uh, versus say what you might uh, use in the classroom where uh, the you know educational setting allows you to uh, make use you know limited use of those materials what's next couple questions on on author care and first off, uh, I'll preface the first one by saying that we we, gen we ask people where they were logging in from, and so we we do genuinely have a a global global audience here. And so for a lot of people, English is not their first language. So their uh, question is, will they get some assistance in in writing in, in you know in proper English? Again, talking about Anglophone publishing here, which then asks another question that comes up, and it's like, what sort of support do publishers offer first time authors? Period, r regardless of language. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I can take that if that's all right, Janet. Um, sure. So I I think you know it depends on the book and the market and the the situation. Um, in sometimes we might have a developmental editor work with a, a non-native speaker on the book. Um, they can just help polish up the book, really for reviewers. Um, we just want to make sure that. Um, you know, generally most reviewers do assume that we will eventually copy edit and, and spell check the book. But that might be something where if you're having a little trouble getting your point across that we need to kind of have someone step in at that point. Um, we do also offer a lot of copy editing. Um, Eric can talk a little bit more about that if, if he has time. But 
that's that's pretty in depth uh, process to make sure that the book really looks polished at the end. And then also in terms of um, uh, you know, other kinds of developmental editing along the way that, that might help someone who's not a native speaker. As far as author support goes, it just varies from book to book as far as what you need. If you need someone to help you develop figures or kind of work on that language, I would say for textbooks, um, you know, we're not really going to look at line editing every single line because we're not the subject matter experts. We really want the instructors to weigh in on things like whether this is the appropriate citation for this paragraph or whether this is the right way to portray this theory. So we do really rely on our, our peer reviewers for that kind of information. I can't help but uh, chime in to say for first time authors uh, and author care and community that method space uh, is here for you. The materials are um, primarily open access. Occasionally we will link to something that might be uh, available through an academic library, but we um, are you know, really striving to provide you know, all kinds of resources for people who are just getting started with um, academic or textbook writing. So, um, you know, if you log into the site, you'll get the new post by email. And then um, earlier, Leah mentioned the Textbook and Academic Authors Association. I'm um, very active in that group. Um, the membership uh, price is quite uh, reasonable, and it is an active community specifically to support writers. And, you know, there you can um, receive a lot of uh, support and access to all kinds of templates and materials that relate to some of the things we're talking about here today. So those are, um, you know, we, we hope that you will uh, come back to Method Space and that, you know, if you have specific questions about uh, things or topics you'd like us to cover, um, please uh, contact me. So a couple of things came up in that last exchange that, that also reflects some of the questions. and. Um, um, First one, are textbooks, they're reviewed, are they peer reviewed? Yes, I would say. Um, it, it's it's not dissimilar from a journal. Uh, it, it, we do think of it as more of a developmental collaborative process with our reviewers as opposed to a journal which can be a little more um, oppositional. So we do ask for a lot more feedback from our reviewers and those reviewers are other instructors at higher education institutions. This is something that I think varies uh, quite a bit by publisher since I've worked mm -hmm. with a variety of publishers. In my view, one of the reasons that I'm a loyal sage uh, person is that that degree of rigor um, you know, is present and you know, I would say that my books are peer reviewed. Um, there, the proposal stage, it is a blind review, and then, uh, you know, it, it's, um, it, it's, you know, a rigorous process, but not all publishers offer that. So if that is something that you want, um, that would be something to look at when you are trying to select a publisher. Uh, and that would be something that you could ask the acquisitions editor about. Oh, you know, what is the review process and who is responsible for it? Because I've also seen um, situations where um, the authors are responsible for basically getting what you would call a friendly review, uh, send this out to colleagues, people in your field, get their feedback. Um, but uh, as you know, that is a, you know, very different from a real, you know, either a single or double blind peer review where uh, people can be much more candid. So we're running out of time and I'm going to have to com combine a whole bunch of questions into this one. And it's just kind of, um, you talked about ebooks earlier, but what about open access in general? What can we, how, how is that affecting the textbook market and what can people that are, are offering proposals that are either in favor of open access or perhaps opposed, how, how do we deal with them and, and what do we, how, again, and one of the things that I, I would like to mention just in that is one person out there is 
hoping that we'll talk about monographs, which I suspect we're not going to, but I did want to point out that SAGE does do open access monographs uh, in our SAGE long form. But anyway, open access, just general question. Ooh, do we have time for another webinar? Um, <laughs> we could really spend a lot of time on open access and, and how it is affecting the books market right now. Um, it is. Um, if you can get a book online for free, there is probably not a reason for you as an instructor to assign that in your class and ask your students to purchase it. Um, so, you know, that that has a reason behind it. But um, I think that means it's really on us to make sure that what we're offering is not just different, but is supportive of instructors, makes teaching easier, things along those lines. Um, and, that, and that's, I think, what we're doing. Um, there may be some the great open access books out there, but you never know. The quality control may not be there. Um, certainly from Sage, we want to make sure that our books are of highest quality and you know that you're getting getting something for the, the money that you will be spending on a, on a textbook. Um, but uh, that being said, we do offer things like open access student resources for our books. We want to make sure students can access those. Um, and we you know, do try to make previews available for them as well. I think we've done some experimenting in the, in the open access market and, and are considering that. We do have the, the Sage Open uh, monographs. And so that might be a great route to go if you're, you're um, you know, very committed to, to open access publishing. What about, um, here's a kind of a, more of a production-y type thing. What about organi uh, footnotes and organizing references? Uh, how, do, how do they get handled? What, what is kind of the process for that? Um, and who organizes that? Hmm. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, it's usually um, provided, um, the, the references and citations are usually um, included um, um, before the uh, book um, enters into production. Um, and so it's, um, yeah, like usually, um, yeah, in, in included um, with each chapter. Um, and then what, what we do in production is we, yeah, review all of those um, uh, sites and references um and uh yeah if there's um if there's any any missing or or um styles need to be um um updated or or um if there if it comes um in if they're at the end of each chapter but then but then the decision is to have it um uh, uh appearing at the very end of the book we can um yeah combine and compile them um into one list um so yeah 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 that's a good question one last question um before we close and, and I, i've got a quote uh, one of my favorite authors not a textbook author douglas adams author of the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy he used to say he loved deadlines and he loved the sound of them whooshing by so what if an author cannot complete a textbook by the date in the contract? Um, or, and larger question that, that's not being asked, but what happens internally when I'm working with something and I, I miss deadlines? What happens to me? Well, there's no official punishments yet. Um, <laughs> but seriously, uh, I, I mean, it, this is something, as soon as you know you're going to miss a deadline, talk to your editor, because we can make adjustments. Um, the contract is not carved in stone. We can issue amendments, especially the earlier in the process. If we're not even at that first draft stage, we can issue a contract amendment to change that date. As we get closer and closer to that final draft deadline, things kind of click into place and we start planning for the publication of the book and marshalling all of our production resources, marketing resources, and it gets harder and harder to change that book. And there might be other things we need to do to talk with you about in order to keep that deadline. Um, but basically, as early as you know, talk to your editor. Well, I'm sad to say that, that we have come to the end. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today with a special thank you to our guests, Eric Garner and Leah Bargastein, and to our host, Janet Sammons. Uh, in the coming weeks, please be on the lookout for an email that will include a link to view the entire webinar and the slides, 
And we will also be answering many of the great questions. And I say that as someone who's done a lot of webinars, and it's like these questions are questions I want answers to, too. But we'll have answers to many of the questions that we did not have time to get to today. And again, to not to sound like a broken record, but there were a lot of questions that we didn't get to today, and they are worth answering. And please stay connected with us at methodspace.com for information about an upcoming webinar from Sage's journals team, how to get published in February. So we don't have more details on that other than it will be in February, but I guarantee you it will be posted on methodspace.com. Thank you all and have a great day.